Good evening, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with you on this 18th of April. Thanks for watching Alaska Weather with us tonight. As always, we encourage you to stay up to date with your local weather information. And you can do so anytime by calling the Alaska Weather Information Line at 1-800-472-0391. Find us online anytime at weather.gov slash Alaska, and you can get your lo local weather forecast that way. Check on the Aviation Weather Unit's information anytime, or check in with the latest breakup information at weather.gov slash APRFC, which is the Alaska Pacific River Forecast Center for short. If you can't find what you're looking for, please let me know. David.Snyder at NOAA.gov is the easiest way to find me on your computer. Here's a look at the hazardous weather information now across the region. We're going to start with the Klondike Highway there. A winter weather advisory is now posted for up to nine inches of new snow starting tonight and going through pretty much all day tomorrow. There's a potential for accumulating snow in that region. I wouldn't be surprised to see a little rain mixed with snow a little bit further down below. And there is a little bit of light snow on the Haynes Highway as well. But the main focus is going to be around the Klondike Highway in the White Pass region for up to nine inches of new snow. Winter is not done with the higher terrain and some of those passes just yet. So keep that in mind. If you are traveling out or you've got folks coming your way, let them know. As you look up north, we have wind advisories for some of the Yukon Valley out toward the Kobuk and Noatak Valleys in the upper areas. Gusts up to 40 miles per hour may be possible through the remainder of the afternoon there. A lot of that will start to settle down as we get into the evening and overnight hours there. So some improvement is expected for the wind. And then up north, a winter weather advisory for snow and some blowing snow. Their visibility may drop down a little bit more tonight and into tomorrow across the Chukchi Coast between Wainwright and Point Hope. So keep that in mind. Winter not done with the North Slope just yet uh, either. Uh, and of course, it is breakup season, and so you can expect to see more of this from us as we go ahead through the rest of the early spring. Uh, in the red shaded area here, uh, we're expecting an above average threat for flooding. As you may have seen uh, in the, over the weekend there, we ran our Alaska Pacific River Forecast Center breakup update there for kind of the preseason outlook with Selena Van Broecklin. Uh, she was telling us that uh, in this region here, this is where we've seen more snow, slightly above average snow, I believe, for most of the areas all the way from the Copper River Basin through the middle of Yukon and out toward the Seward Peninsula and the Kobuk and Noatak Valley region. In these areas, we can expect a slightly increased risk for uh, uh, flooding, and you'll notice there's a yellow dot here. Basically, that means uh, that there is moderate flood potential in that region. That would apply to the Fairbanks area and generally uh, around the North Pole region because of the China uh, flood control measures. Sometimes there's a little extra groundwater in that region because of that, and so that's what the yellow dot is indicating. For southeast, for south central, for the western areas of uh, the Alaska Range into the Susitna Valley, below average flood potential is expected at this point. Anytime you want to see this, head over to weather.gov slash APRFC. And as breakup begins, we will start showing the breakup map that you're used to as we start tracking the actual changes along the rivers as we go. This from your Alaska Pacific River Forecast Center. Let's go on to the visible satellite picture and you can see the southerly flow taking over the Gulf of Alaska, spreading more clouds into southeast and south central. I uh, saw some nice cloud formations over south central today. If you saw the low hanging bubbles of clouds, those are called momentous clouds. We also saw plenty of wave Wave clouds, those kind of crest over the mountains there, a downwind uh, indicating some high level turbulence crossing over. And we did get some high level turbulence reports out of the Seward Peninsula and the Bethel area. They're from some of our large commercial uh, airliners earlier today, some uh, Boeing 777s uh, indicating some moderate to severe turbulence over there. So uh, certainly. Uh, some, uh, big, uh, some big bumps out there for some big planes. Out across the west, St. Paul and St. George, seeing uh, low pressure moving through the region. Their visibilities came down to about five miles by mid to late afternoon. So uh, certainly some lower decks out there, but nothing too bad for St. Paul and St. George at this time. Out across the west, that northwesterly flow working through the Bering Sea, uh, pushing a lot of colder air into the west. And this main low pressure center that we see across the west is going to reform gradually across the central and eastern gulf, really bringing the focus for precipitation and, and more lousy weather back into southeast. In the meantime, severe clear for many locations across the interior. We're looking at the infrared satellite picture now. And one thing to note, uh, high pressure up north is pushing low clouds and cold air southward. We're going to see a big uh, push of that cold air. You can actually kind of see it working its way southward right now already uh, into the, uh, the middle and eastern interior. So some changes coming with that. Uh, as you see, high pressure up across the Arctic, 1,030 millibars there. Compare that to 983 millibars across the southern Bering. That's working in front into southwestern Alaska and the central Bering. As this rain continues pressing eastward, it's really going to focus its way into southeast. A period of pretty wet and unsettled weather there with a steady southerly flow. Winds are coming up as well for southeast. Watch for some areas to have 
uh, gusts uh, throughout the day of up to about 40 miles per hour through a large part of southeast. But uh, as we pointed out earlier in the show, already a, a pretty good focus for snow around the White Pass region. And over the next uh, well, 24 to maybe 30 hours or so, you can expect to see up to 9 inches of new snow in that region and maybe some light accumulations around the Haines Highway as well. Low pressure is going to hold in the northern Gulf at 996 millibars. Uh, we're not quite done with the southern bearing, though. At 984 millibars, we'll keep a low pressure center uh, sitting out there. That should drag in enough cold for some rain and snow north of the central chain all the way out toward Nikolsky and perhaps the Alaska Peninsula looking at some occasional mixing there. Now the main core of cold though is really going to stay up across the north. North of Eagle up toward Kaktovik and westward toward Barrow is really where the coldest air is centered around high pressure sitting there. But that is going to start dropping southward a little bit more on Thursday. And as that happens, the pressure gradient across north and western Alaska is going to tighten up a little bit more. Because of that, we expect to see some blowing snow and at times uh, perhaps some poor visibility. It could be under or about a half mile. And that's what that winter weather advisory is referencing that we were talking about for the Chukchi Coast a little while ago. The low pressure will sit very close to south central Alaska. You'll notice the wave that was moving across the Gulf has kind of fallen apart into just a trough of low pressure. That just means the temperature difference along that boundary has kind of fallen apart. We'll keep gray skies and low clouds across the region for south central Prince William Sound all the way into the northern Gulf. But the further east you go, the better chance you're going to have of seeing uh, any precipitation there. Friday's weather shows that colder air is dropping further south and high pressure is a lot closer to Barrow and Wayne right now at 1,024 millibars. With that, I'd expect to see a better chance of fog, especially across the coast and into the coastal plain. Don't be surprised to see IFR on and off throughout a good part of the, the rest of the weekend, certainly into the weekend as this ridge stays right on top of the coast. But you'll notice that as a sharp cutoff there along the Brooks Range and south of that condition should be fairly dry, though they will be breezy, it looks like, as we go into Saturday and Sunday. So don't be surprised if those wind advisories come back as well. That typically means gusts in the interior could be upwards of 40 miles per hour or so. And you can see for the Gulf, things don't really improve very much for Friday either. Uh, low pressure sits very close to Bristol Bay and just south of Lake Iliamna. Uh, the center of those low pressures are not terribly strong, but they're enough to keep kind of the slop going into the Chugach Range. And parts of southeast will continue to see showers there. Higher terrain, still looking at a chance for snow showers, maybe mixing in with rain from time to time. A watchful eye shows low pressures just south of the central chain. That's at 980 millibars, and that trough, kind of that shaft of unsettled weather extends all the way into the western end of the Bering Sea and with that comes a chance for some rain and snow in that region as well. But for the west coast conditions should be fairly dry. You can see the uh, YK Delta uh, generally an offshore flow there and uh, probably some hit and miss clouds as we head into your Friday and certainly on into your Saturday too. Let's take a look at temperatures across the region and as you would guess with uh, a little more daylight across the region uh, temperatures overall are coming up. In fact, fairly mild weather continues for the region. Southeast, 30s and 40s there as you head into the overnight hours. Looking at lows in the mid to upper 30s for South Central from Kenai all the way down toward Homer and Kodiak, uh, probably about 36 to 37 degrees. Prince William Sound, Whittier, Seward, uh, you're looking at temps back in the mid 30s there as you get out toward Golcana, lower 20s, up toward Talkeetna, 33. Fort Yukon, though, still holding on to the cold, 5 degrees above zero as you get even further north, Arctic Village, 4 below. Temperatures will be sub-zero for the North Slope as well, but not uh, certainly as cold as they have been this season. Teens and 20s for Kotzebue Sound, uh, back into the upper 20s for most of Norton Sound. Nome, you're looking at 23. Gamble, uh, looking at 28 degrees. Nunavak Island, about 32. Bethel and many parts of southwest, including Bristol Bay, at or just below freezing with St. Paul and St. George about 35 degrees and mid to upper 30s for most of southwest and the chain. High temperatures out southwest tomorrow back in the mid to upper 40s. South central closing in on 50 degrees, 46 in Kodiak, mid 40s for southeast with clouds and rain, 29 in Fort Yukon in the low 40s there around the middle Tanana Valley. Out toward Tanana itself at Ambler and Bettles, it'll get even colder back into the 30s for highs tomorrow and teens for the north slope. By Friday morning, we're 5 to 10 below for morning low temperatures there. Kotzebue, Shishmaref back in the teens, Nome at 19 degrees, upper 20s for most in southwest. In the upper Kuskokwim around McGrath, about 26. Kodiak, 36 degrees, above freezing for the chain in the Alaska Peninsula with St. Paul and St. George at 33. Upper 30s and lower 40s for southeast Yakutat, you're at 36 with a high tomorrow. Closing in on 44, mid to upper 40s for most of southeast. The Susitna Valley could be warm on Friday afternoon with high temperatures back in the lower to mid 50s. Near 50 around Prince William Sound, a little bit cooler than that as you head down Cook Inlet. The middle Tanana Valley back in the mid-40s, southwest, upper 40s to about 50, and the north slope in the single digits. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. 
On the flying weather now, IFR conditions will start to spread out a little bit more across the Gulf as we head into Thursday and Friday. With the Gulf low transitioning from more of a western storm to more of an eastern storm, we're going to have a lot more visibility and ceiling issues across the Gulf. Uh, the interior, though, generally stays via far south of the Alaska Range is where most of these issues will be. Across the north slope, though, high pressure pushing cold, wet air southward into the Brooks Range will also create periods of low ceiling and visibility in that area, not to mention much colder air. This is Thursday morning. As we go into Thursday afternoon, you'll see the focus shifting into more of the two gas range, the Copper River Basin, as well as some of the higher terrain of southeast. Most of the inside passages will at least be MVFR with periods of rain and even some snow up around the Klondike Highway and the White Pass region. Out to the west, look for IFR conditions around St. Matthew and the Priblobs and the western Aleutian chain, MVFR for just about the rest of the Bering Sea. By the time you get into Friday morning, again, once again, the morning stratus will be upon us across the north slope. IFR generally north of the Brooks Range summits all the way across the north coast. Across the west, IFR is fairly widespread across the Bering and through the Bering, uh, through the Alaska Peninsula and the eastern chain. Some holes there. Uh, just west of Nikolsky, IFR across the southern end of Kodiak Island. Uh, look for VFR conditions around Cook Inlet, but just around everywhere else in South Central, uh, expecting to start around IFR. And the same goes for some of the higher terrain, even Juneau, as we get into Friday morning. With some improvements noted by the afternoon on Friday, you can see considerable improvement across the North Slope, but still, some of your passes, especially if you're heading uh, from south to north through Anaktuvik or Adigan Pass, uh, you'll uh, have a, a much lower ceiling and uh, lower visibility as you go through. Out across the west, St. Paul and St. George, all the way down toward Adak and Atka, expecting to see IFR conditions there. And we're still looking at IFR around some of the Alaska Range passes and certainly the Chugach Range in the Kenai Mountains as we get into your afternoon Friday. Let's take a look at your pass conditions to start anyway on Thursday and uh, probably again on Friday, at least IFR for Anaktuvik and Attigan Pass, expecting some improvement throughout the day, but those improvements will be passing through from time to time and could get better and then go back to being worse. So keep your eye on the weather there around Attigan and Anaktuvik Pass. Lake Clark and Merrill Pass looking for some general improvements throughout the day, but you'll recall seeing Friday morning again starting out at IFR, so probably a repeat for your day Thursday and again into Friday. Rainy Pass expected to see IFR conditions there with some improvement noted throughout the day, probably a start again at IFR on Friday. Windy Pass expected to hold around marginal conditions through most of the day and leaning that way toward marginal for Isabel Pass. Mentasta Pass expecting to see that lean over toward IFR as we go throughout your Thursday. Tanita Pass also starting at IFR conditions there and then leaning over towards some improvement but will probably be right back into IFR by early Friday morning. Portage Pass at least holds there, especially on the eastern side. The western side, as we saw, could see some VFR conditions uh, pretty much up and down Cook Inlet. And Chilkoot and White Pass were expecting to hold at IFR really most of the period for Thursday and Friday with the potential for some heavier snowfall in the region. Freezing levels indicate a uh, warm bubble here across uh, the Bering Strait into Norton Sound and the northern part of the Yukon Delta region out towards St. Lawrence Island. Levels there at or above 2,000 feet. Another surge of warmer air is moving in across the western chain and you can see at least some warming here across the eastern Gulf with low pressure working its way into the eastern Gulf. Most of the state though at or at least below the surface freezing line with the exception of southwestern Alaska and Kodiak Island. A little bit of warmer air lingering there at the surface. Freezing potential is going to be changing a lot, especially around the Gulf Coast communities as we go through your Thursday and into Friday. The orange areas are considerable moderate. Now, there is going to be uh, some substantial precipitation around the Gulf Coast, and that will affect exactly how much icing threat is there across southeast and the northern Gulf especially. So count on at least isolated moderate throughout part of your day. Uh, levels between about four to 10,000 feet across the western parts of the Yukon, the Copper River Basin, all the way down to southeast. And that's a big stretch. And out across southwestern Alaska, levels there above eight or six to 8,000 feet and much lower up north above 2,000 feet. And that's probably the best uh, likelihood of actually running into some icing potential there. The jet stream has the fast quarter of uh, air moving through the Gulf around 65 to 100 knots. You can see a uh, ridge taking shape across southeast and then a much broader push of the Pacific jet across the North Pacific there around almost 150 knots and northerly winds coming in at 30,000 feet there. 9,000 feet, you've got our northerlies coming in across the Brooks Range, 10 to 20 knots or so. Southwesterlies moving across the Gulf, 25 to as strong as 40 knots. And a similar pattern here at 3,000 feet. Again, those northerlies are really important to the weather pattern, 20 to 40 knots or so across the north slope. As we look at turbulence, we will have some issues across the north and eastern Gulf, below 6,000 feet, considerable chop across the west and northern interior as well.
It used to be that you could only warn one person about a tornado after it had already blown down someone else's barn. Now, on average, we're able to issue a tornado warning 15 minutes before the tornado's even there, and that wouldn't be happening without Doppler radar. This next rad system has reduced fatalities on the order of 45% due to tornadoes since its advent. We have a lot more information now about storms and being able to understand how they develop, how they produce severe weather, and how that information might be used to improve warnings for our National Weather Service partners. The lab is unique in that we serve the nation by supporting the National Weather Service in its mission to protect lives and safe property by improving the accuracy and the lead time of severe weather warnings. We have a legacy of radar research and converting existing technology from military to weather purposes. A recycled Doppler radar led to the development of NEXRAD, installed nationwide in the early 90s. It allowed forecasters to see storms like never before. Not only did we help bring that technology to the National Weather Service and to help protect lives and property, but we have continued to upgrade that technology, keep it relevant, and keep it state of the art. Recently, a major upgrade was added. Dual polarization technology takes the radar from 2D to 3D. Forecasters now know more about what type of precipitation is falling which is very helpful during winter storms, as well as how much rain is accumulating, resulting in better flash flood warnings. The radar can also detect and track tornadoes based on debris. Looking to the future, the National Severe Storms Lab is testing the capabilities of phased array radar. Originally used by the U.S. Navy, the antenna scans the skies electronically rather than mechanically, allowing the radar to focus on a storm. With current technology, we get a full picture or image of what is going on within a storm every four to five minutes. So it's more like a snapshot. Whereas with phased array radar, we get that picture of what's going on in the storm every minute. So it becomes more like watching a movie. So we can do adaptive, rapid scanning on the storms that matter most, being able to provide the information that's most relevant when and where it's happening. Another advantage of phased array radar is its multifunction capability, providing weather and air traffic information simultaneously. Number one, it is a system that promises to replace and expand upon the existing weather surveillance radars. Secondly, to replace aging air traffic surveillance radars. And number three, it offers a potential application to meet Department of Homeland Security and Defense requirements for identifying and tracking non-cooperative aircraft. With the replacement of all these various radars with a single system, the American taxpayer could realize substantial savings in cost. You have a lot fewer radars to maintain and the electronic capability of this also reduces maintenance costs because you do not have moving parts. Not too long ago, the ability to predict severe weather was thought to be impossible. During the past several decades, research conducted at the National Severe Storms Lab has developed life-saving tools like Doppler radar. We've progressed from no warning of threatening weather to about a 15-minute lead time, and current research promises to extend that much further. Our knowledge of severe storms and how they behave, and our use and ability to use the Doppler radar technology and is, is in a lot of cases a direct result of that close working relationship, that research to operations component that we get between the National Severe Storms Laboratory and a forecast office. That history and understanding of how these data can be used by our users and doing the research to help advance the use of radar technology, really it's what we live for, it's in our lifeblood, it's in our history.
It's now easier than ever to be a part of Weather Research. We just launched the mPing app for both iPhone and Android users, and it's totally free. Ping, which stands for Precipitation Identification Near the Ground, is a research project by the NOAA National Severe Storms Lab and the University of Oklahoma. With the mobile app, you can send us your weather observations on the go. Are snowflakes falling on your head? Is hail hitting your car? Just select what type of precipitation is falling and press submit. It's that easy. It takes about five seconds and it's anonymous. Reports can then be viewed online. Our scientists will compare your report with what the radar has detected. This helps us develop new radar technologies and techniques. Download the app today, share your reports, and let's work together to make our nation weather ready. Learn more here and follow us. And now, marine weather around Alaska. And now we'll look at today's sea ice edge. You'll notice continued erosion of that southernmost ice edge, uh, the marginal ice zone expanding now into the Bering Strait, probably some pockets of open water in there as well. But the overall Polynya is expanding westward as the east to westerly flow is pushing some of that higher concentration ice pack out of Kotzebue Sound and out of Norton Sound. So no surprises, we're seeing more blue on the chart there. Anytime you want to check out the current conditions, make sure you head to weather.gov slash anchorage slash ice for the latest information from the Alaska Sea Ice Programs page. Here's a look at what's going on in southeast. We're going to have stronger southeasterly flow as a front is moving into the outer coast starting tonight and into tomorrow. Notice the gusts coming up as well. Uh, easily some gales in the region and uh, winds and gusts for some of the uh, land areas over 40 miles an hour. Don't be surprised to have kind of a blustery day as we go. Uh, 35 knots up around the Lynn Canal. Six foot seas there as you head down south from Stevens Passage into the Clarence Strait region. 35 knots sustained. Otherwise south and easterly flow coming up the outer coast. 35 to 40 knots with 12 to 14 foot seas across the northern outer coast and 15 to 16 foot seas as you head down toward the Dixon entrance. As you get into Thursday, I'm sorry, Friday, uh, winds should diminish somewhat but skies will continue to be fairly gray and uh, ceilings fairly low it looks like with rain and against snow up north. Uh, steady southerly flow coming up the outer coast 15 to 20 with seas ranging from about 10 to 11 feet on Friday. Across south central northeasterly flow inside the Prince William Sound region 20 knots with a four foot sea. East winds coming across the northern gulf at 35 knots but an opposing flow 15 to 20 is expected a little bit further south looking for seas six to seven feet and northeasterly is coming down Cook Inlet 20 to 25, a little bit lighter though as you head out side of Kachemak Bay. Uh, Northeasterly is 15 knots, three foot seas there west of the Barrens. For Friday, the light winds continue in that region over the Barren Islands, only 15 knots. A southerly flow coming up Cook Inlet at 20 knots with a five foot sea there. Southeasterly is inside of Prince William Sound and light southerly flow across the northern gulf continues 15 to 20 knots with a seven to eight foot sea there, all in advance of low pressure. Thursday across Bristol Bay, expect an easterly flow at 20 knots with 5 foot seas, 8 foot seas down the Bering Sea coast with that southeasterly wind. South and westerly is coming into Kodiak Island and down the Pacific coastline, 10 to 20 knots with 8 to as high as 14 foot seas there down around Sand Point. You'll see a little bit of improvement on Friday. Winds stay fairly light and seas are generally small across the Bering Sea. 15 knot winds and 3 to 5 foot seas there. South and westerlies continue across the Pacific. Light winds and small seas inside of Shelikov Strait on Friday with only 10 knots and 2 foot seas there. For the central and western chain, 15 to 20 knots expected out west to 9 foot seas there from Kiska to Attu. And that westerly wind will continue to feed into low pressure heading out into the western gulf, looking for 13 to 15 foot seas across the bearing. For the Pacific, as much as 19 foot seas south and west of Nikolsky to Atka. As we get into Friday, you'll notice the winds shifting around to more of an easterly flow uh, as low pressure moves further and further east. Uh, it's starting to feed into the next system coming in from the south and the west. And you can tell the low pressure systems right about here, south and west of Adak and southeast of Kiska. Winds generally about 25 to 30 knots or so. Seas ranging from 6 to 8 feet in the west. And uh, just south of Atka and Adak, you can expect seas a little bit higher, up to 8 to 9 feet there on Friday. For the west coast, north and easterly winds there, 15 to 20 in all areas. A northerly flow around St. Paul and St. George on 20 knots. Uh, more of a northeasterly wind coming out of Norton Sound. And once again, that offshore wind is pushing the uh, ice edge that's higher in concentration away from the coast, helping to create more Polinias. As we get into Friday, northerly winds will continue across the area. Four to six foot seas expected from Norton Sound down towards St. Lawrence Island. But a light southerly flow develops around St. Paul and St. George. 
forth what seas are expected there. Uh, look for a northwesterly flow as uh, nearby as uh, the Kuskokwim Delta region. For the North Slope now, northeasterly winds coming down. The Chukchi coast will stay fairly strong, 25 to 30 knots, and with that again, blowing snow is possible. So a winter weather advisory is posted for right now. Northwesterlies across the Beaufort Sea coast will hold around 15 knots as we get into Friday. That becomes more of a northeasterly wind as we go throughout the day. Northeasterlies coming down the Chukchi coast will continue to hold around 20 to 25 knots, and northerlies through the Bering Strait at 25 knots could produce as high as six foot seas. And yes, that means there is some open water in the Bering Strait. Let's take a look at tonight's forecast once again. A winter weather advisory is posted for the White Pass area and the Klondike Highway. Up to nine inches of new snow by the time that's all said and done by late tomorrow. A front's moving ashore, bringing more rain to a good part of southeast. Also looking for wind advisories for the central and northern interior. Winds could gust up to 40 miles per hour there. And the Chukchi Coast under a winter weather advisory because it's still winter in the Northlands there. Watch for low visibility down to about half mile at times. Low pressure will keep things unsettled across the Gulf Coast as we head through Friday and a chance for some light snow as possible in the eastern interior. Thanks for watching. See you again tomorrow. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.